<laughs> okay. Well, let's uh, let's go ahead and get going for today. So, make sure you get your uh, problem set in if you haven't done so. Um, come on down and, and hand it in. Um, the other thing is that that quiz is due tonight. So make sure you get that quiz. We'll definitely be done um, with the material for it. So make sure you do that tonight, please. Just go do it right after class so you don't forget, okay? Um, I know Friday night sometimes hard time to remember to do a quiz. So make sure you get that done tonight, okay? Um, okay, so, uh, and then of course our exam is on, not Monday, but Wednesday, okay? Probably could have had it on Monday, but we'll go ahead and keep it on Wednesday, okay? So, um, Oh, crud. Okay, well, just a second. Okay, I'm gonna have to go wired today. So, okay, so um, our riddle, I am sometimes white, uh, although sometimes I'm black. I'll take you there, but never bring you back. What am I? Yeah. What's that? I think a hearse. A hearse, exactly right, a hearse. Yeah, it's morbid, but it works. Okay, okay, so uh, last time we left off um, right here, exciting day. We're going to go through ATP synthase, which is, is as I've said before, is my favorite molecule. Okay, so um, really cool structure, really cool um, enzyme and mechanism. Uh, if you remember on Wednesday, I uh, went over um, both the thermodynamics and started going over the structure of this. So the thermodynamics, just the take home message from that is that uh, for this enzyme, the energy required to make ATP is not needed to make the phosphate and hydrate bond, but rather to remove ATP from the active site of the enzyme. So I mentioned this on uh, Wednesday, but the uh, KD for uh, the enzyme for ATP is in the picomolar range. Uh, ATP concentrations in the cell are in the millimolar range, so um, it it really speaks to the fact that this uh, enzyme is about 90 to 90, or about 95 to 99 percent occupied by ATP all the time, un unless there is constant removal of ATP from the active site. Okay, um, so we're looking for this molecular crowbar, and we started going over the structure. Uh, the structure really consists of an F1 component and an FO component. The F1 component is made of nine subunits. Seven of them are shown here. Um, six of them, six of the seven shown here, are these alpha and beta pairs. Um, and really between the two alpha and beta pairs, really more on the beta side of things, um, is uh, the active site to make ATP. Right. Now, those alpha and beta pairs can, as I mentioned on Wednesday, can adopt one of three different conformations. O, uh, which has no ATP bound, T, which has ATP bound, and then L, which has the substrates ADP and inorganic phosphate bound. Um, now, in between these, and there's three different alpha and beta pairs, sitting in between those um, are, is this gamma shaft. Uh, and that gamma shaft is asymmetric and its uh, orientation and its interaction with the alpha and beta pairs dictates what conformation that alpha and beta pair is in. Okay, so there's a certain portion of the structure of the gamma shaft that when facing one of the alpha beta pairs, that alpha beta pair will always be in the O. And I went ahead and, and uh, just put a pink dot where that portion of the gamma shaft, wherever that's facing, that alpha and beta pair will be in the O conformation. And now understand what we're saying here is that uh, if you can start to move that thing around, you can force conformational changes. Uh, and what's also interesting is that, um, that if you think 120 degree turn from the O conformation, you'll find the, a, the, the alpha and beta pair in the T conformation, 
Okay. Now, the orientation that we're looking at, I'm going to be talking about it from a clockwise direction. We'll always be looking at it, or we're looking down so it'll be clockwise. Uh, if you actually reorient this, you can get it in the counterclockwise direction. Okay. So, uh, but we're going to look at it from a clockwise direction. Okay. So the gamma shaft, quite legitimately, is our molecular crowbar. We just need to figure out well, how can that move, and how can a proton gradient cause that. To move. Okay, now to do that, we need to cover the rest of the structure. And so we'll just go to this slide here. Not much uh, on this slide other than to mention these two subunits. Okay, these guys right up here. Okay, uh, epsilon and delta. These just simply connect that gamma shaft uh, to that yellow structure, which is a portion of the FO component. Okay. Um, so they play a, a structural role. They're very important, of course, uh, but we don't need to say much more about them. They're just a connection between essentially the lollipop stick and the FO component. Okay. Now let's go ahead and look at the FO component then. Um, and the FO component uh, it consists of 17 to 24 different subunits. Um, the variability in the number will demonstrate because it has to do with the number of what we call C subunits. So we'll look at that um, as we go forward. What you're looking at over here on the left um, will be either a cartoon rendering of the molecule or, um, or more structural data um, of the molecule. Okay? Um, let me go ahead and, and just draw some lines here to orient us in terms of where the membrane would be. So this would be the P side, this would be the N side. Okay, to give you a sense of that. The FO component, as I mentioned um, on Wednesday, and I'll go ahead and mention again, okay, is all of these subunits that are marked with an English, uh, or a letter from the English alphabet, okay? Now, I'm going to come right back to this slide, but I decided to go a little bit out of order. I think it, it flows a little bit better. Let's go ahead and go to, to this slide here and just mention this because there's not much I want to say about it, and that will won't disrupt the flow. I want to mention this thing right here. This is often called the stator, okay? Um, it's made up of B, D, F6, O, C, o S, C, P subunits, okay? There are lots of different subunits, but it's this long extension. Um, that goes from essentially um, the membrane all the way down to essentially the, the, the lollipop, okay? And it sits at the top of the lollipop, okay? Right. And that, that's called the stator, okay? It plays a very important structural role, but we don't need to say too much more about it, okay? Now, let me come back here, and we'll get rolling on what's called the A subunit. The A subunit and the C subunits are going to be what comprise the majority of our um, discussion today. So the A subunit, right, if you look at it over here in this drawing, it'll be shown right here, okay, the stator is bound to it. Um, if you look over on the, just to the left of this, over in this thing here, there's not an A subunit. We don't have uh, x-ray crystallographic structure of the A subunit. Okay, as of right now. So everything that you're looking at over here on the left, um, all of this in that really colorful aspect of that figure will be crystal structures of the subunits um, that we have solved. Okay. Outside of that, hopefully you can kind of see this outline here. Okay. Outside of that, all of that kind of gray outline is an electron micrograph structure of ATP synthase. Not nearly as high resolution, but you'll notice there's some definite gaps in this. Um, and as of right now, uh, it is the, the opinion of the field that the position of the A subunit would be go right here. Okay, so proposed placement of that A subunit's right there. Now, here would be the high resolution structure of the A subunit. <laughs> okay. A uh, really terrible drawing. Uh, okay, but we'll call that the A subunit just to illustrate um, two features of what we expect the A subunit to look like, and that is that these, it has these half channels. Um, I'll go ahead and, uh, it says cytosolic half channel. Let me just go ahead and put P side half channel. It would be more consistent with what I've been talking about and inside 
half channel. Okay, and you can see that these are definitely outlined here and here. Okay, and the proposal is that the A subunit has essentially the capacity to move a proton about halfway through the membrane. Protons are, of course, positive charges, they're cations. The inner membrane of the mitochondria is impermeable to them unless they can be transported across the membrane. So when we look at this, you can envision a proton from the P side, so this would be P side, going into this environment here. Okay, I mean the way it's drawn it would seem that it would diffuse in there, it might be a little bit more complicated than that. Okay. But if it can make it over to the other half channel, so if that proton can arrive here, then it will, of course, diffuse out into the inside. And it's now gone from a high concentration to a low concentration, which is energetically downhill and favorable. Okay. The question is, how can the proton get from here to here? Okay. How would it arrive in that um, inside half channel when it goes through the P side half channel? So that's the A subunit. Again, not a lot of detailed structural information on this, um, but we have um, at least this model. Okay. Now, how does the proton move? That brings us to something called the C subunit or the C ring. And some of you think, hmm, C ring. Didn't we have some discussion about the C ring and there was some assumption about a C ring of nine subunits? Exactly right. When we calculated PO ratios, I said that we're going to assume a C ring of nine subunits. Okay, well that gets us to this. The C ring is comprised of what we call C subunits. Okay? And there is anywhere between 8 to 15 different C subunits that can be found in any given ATP synthase molecule. Okay, that will give the variability in terms of the numbers up here, 17 to 24. Is that 18 to, to 15? Or I'm sorry, 8 to 15. Okay. Um, the one that we are looking at, so if we were to draw a line here, the one that we're looking at on the right here, this would be comprised, as you might be able to recognize, of eight subunits. Okay. Um, and they're just alternating colors. So this, if we put our eyeball, let me go ahead and do this. Put our eyeball right here. Okay. That will let us see the structure like this. Okay. And you can see, obviously, the eight subunits alternating orange and yellow color. Okay. Now, some of you might look at that and say, oh, look at that hole. Is that where protons go through? No. No, we're going to put a big blockade in that. That's not where it goes through. Okay. So, in fact, that hole would have the gamma shaft okay, covering it. Okay, just so we have an understanding of that. Now, the important feature of the C ring in each of these C subunits okay, can be illustrated below here when we look at the alpha helices. Okay, each of these subunits, go ahead and highlight one of them here, each of them consists of two transmembrane spanning alpha helices. Okay? Um, and on the alpha helix that's on the outside of the C ring, you'll see, kind of see here, there's a red dot on each one of them, okay? That, if we were to go over here, is right here, okay? Red maybe, let me go ahead and, there we go. That's on the outside helix, on the outside of the C ring. Each subunit has one of those, okay? That dot represents an acidic side chain, either aspartate or glutamate, depending on organism. Okay, um, let's just go ahead and say it is an aspartate. Okay, just so you remember this, aspartate, its side chain in the protonated form looks like that. Okay, that can of course go undergo acid base chemistry to become this. Carboxylic acid will form a negative charge. Of course, going in that direction, your proton's coming off. Going in this direction, your proton's coming on. Okay? That aspartate or glutamate is 
theorized to be carrying the proton from the P channel in the A subunit all the way around to the N half channel. Okay. That, so if you come back here, look at this, the C ring would sit essentially right here. Okay, and so each of those C subunits has the capacity to interact with these half channels. And the proposal is that aspartate or glutamate sits in those half channels and can undergo acid-base type chemistry. The protonate, it can actually carry that proton to the other, um, to the other half channel, okay? And it's super awesome. Questions on that? Yes? So with the movement of the hydrogen ion then through uh, those half channels, so is there just one glutamate or aspartate that is moving it from each half channel, or is it a series of glutamate and aspartates that kind of shovels that hydrogen down between the two? Well, so we don't know what the half channel is comprised of. So, so if you're talking about, like if you come back here, if your question, um, is in regards to this, is there a series of, right, of acid-base groups that line that channel that allow it to go down? That's probably more likely, okay? The spartate and glutamate I'm talking about, though, are independent of those half channels. So if you think about, um, it, let's say it is uh, a chain of acid-base events that gets that proton halfway through, so it's not really a channel where it just kind of floats in there but it jumps from one acid in, uh, at base to another, the last jump would be to one of the C subunits. Okay, so to that aspartate or glutamate side chain on a C subunit. Okay. So are those half channels then, hypothetically, would they be kind of like offset then, where it would be yes. on one side, moves to the uh, actual glutamate or something inside the actual like C subunit, and then would pop up for, for the other one? Yeah, so the half channels are definitely offset. Okay. You can't do this. Okay, they can't transfer directly from left to right. They have to be carried, and they have to be carried by C W, and it's going to take a roundabout way to get there, and I'll show you that here in a little bit. Yeah? You just said roundabout. What I was, what I was thinking in my head was uh, primarily how the A unit is, the A unit and the C unit complex. Vaguely, minus the bonding parts, kind of acts like a roundabout or a tractor circle. You It, it, it's kind of like that, yeah. So, I mean, the, if you didn't hear what she was saying, essentially what she's saying is if you've ever driven and you get in a roundabout, you go around the, the circle and then you exit through a spot. All right, that's kind of like this, except for this roundabout has only one entry point and one exit point, okay? Unlike what you'd be doing driving, there'd be multiple, uh, you know, exit and entry points. So, but yes, it's kind of like that. In fact, I've got a video of it that will, I think, hopefully clarify it. Okay. Other questions? Yes? Of the, of the A subunit? Yeah, so why is it so difficult to solve the structure of the A subunit? Because crystallography is hard. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, it's, uh, it's just been refractory to, to crystallizing. Um, so, I, I obviously, I've never worked on it personally, so I've never really talked to anyone that has worked on it. Um, generally speaking, membrane proteins um, are harder to, to work with from a crystallographic standpoint. Because most of what you want to do in terms of not only purifying the protein and that kind of stuff, you want to work in an aqueous environment, and this is resistant to working in those environments. So you have to find the right like lipid um, balance of proteins, and then can you keep it folded? And then if you can, can you get it to crystallize? And you can't. You have to avoid hydrophilic crystallization um, conditions, and that can be really hard. So uh, that's more than likely the explanation. With advances in electron microscopy, the hope would be that we'll be able to get a high-resolution structure of it with that, um, but that's forthcoming. So, other questions? Okay. All right. So let's go ahead um, and and do this. Okay. So we got this idea 
Okay, we've talked about the stator now, but we've got the idea that we can start to move from one half channel to another um, the protons. This, you can look at this slide. I'm not going to draw on this slide at all because the video is so much better, but this is, I mean, a kind of a depiction uh, that I've seen in the primary journal articles uh, that are trying to illustrate what's going on. But let's go ahead and go to this video here um, and this one, okay? And this is, I mean, this is, this is so much fun. Oh, wait, don't go, it got, it got a little bit jumpy there. Okay, so what you were looking at, you can't see it. Ah, that's better, right? Is it better? Okay, good. All right, so um, we'll kind of make this out here. Um, so what you were looking at, of course, is ATP synthase. Now, you're going to learn really quickly that yellow blocks are protons in this, okay? They're, and that's, that um, has some scientific significance to it. Actually, I'm just joking. Okay, but anyway, um, so yellow blocks are protons. Um, you can see here, um, you know, if you look at my, see where my cursor is pointing, that would be the C ring. Just adjacent to it would be the A subunit. This would be, this whole thing would be the stator. This right here would be the gamma shaft, and then we've got alpha and beta subunits down here, okay? Up here, uh, where am I? Up here would be the P side. This would be the N side, okay? So what we're going to do here, I'm going to go ahead and advance this just a little bit, okay? And we're going to focus in on that A subunit. Um, and you can start to see these yellow blocks entering into the A subunit and actually leaving them if you're looking in the right place, okay? There's the, they label the rotor, and let's go ahead and pause it. Oh, shoot, I got, of course I didn't pause it. All right, let's watch it again. I, it's so cool that we have to watch it again. I'm surprised this isn't on Netflix, to be honest with you. But, uh, okay. All right, so, all right, there we go. So there's that entry channel, and you can kind of see those yellow blocks are going into that entry channel from the PSI. That would, of course, be the protons. Uh, they are attaching here to each individual C ring. Or, I'm sorry, each individual C subunit of the C ring, okay, at that proposed aspartate or glutamate. Okay, now... The idea would be that every time a protonation event occurs, there would be a conformational change that would drive the C ring in the way that we've been looking at it in the clockwise direction. Okay, and you can kind of see this, how this would be going in the clockwise direction. Okay, so that's what's happening here as we look at this. It's turning because it's going in this, right? There's this protonation event that causes a conformational change that just goes in the clockwise direction. Okay, and these things that you can just find it kind of follow one around until finally it gets all the way out here and then there's this exit channel, okay, and there's that exit channel. Okay, when that C ring or that C subunit comes all the way around to that inside half channel, the, the chemistry is such that, of course, pH is higher, okay, in the inside that that will be deprotonated and go down. That will further the, the conformational change that's driving this movement, C ring movement, okay. Now understand that the number of subunits in the ring dictate how many protons are needed to go in a 360 degree circle. So if there's 10 subunits, it's going to go, it's going to take 10 protons to get all the way around 360 degrees. If it's nine, obviously nine protons, you get the idea, okay? It'll be different depending on the size of the C ring, okay? Now also notice that that's what's driving, right, movement. Okay, question. Did you have a question? It does. Yeah, we'll get to it. I got a whole slide on C rings. How many is how many are there? So we'll we'll get to that. We'll talk about PO ratios. Yeah. So l let's just wait for a little bit uh, on that question. It's a good question. All right now, let let's do this. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and fast forward just a little bit because this is just going to go through some fun stuff. Fun stuff. Okay. There you go. All right. Um, and we're going to come here, right here. This will work. Actually, a little bit further. Okay. So what you're looking at now. Still a little bit hard to see, okay? Is it, but 
um, you're looking at essentially what we have solved in terms of crystal structure, okay? So we're getting away from the cartoon representation um, and getting more to scientific data. And what I want to concentrate on here is what's happening at the alpha and beta subunits because the C ring is moving, okay? C ring is connected to, remember, the gamma shaft through that delta and epsilon subunit. And then the gamma shaft, I said, if that moves, it can drive conformational changes in alpha and beta pairs, okay? So let me go ahead and, and um, uh, push play here in a little bit, but something else to keep in mind in this, red rectangles are ATP, okay? Gray rectangles are ADP, and little yellow uh, disks are, are inorganic phosphate, okay? So let's go ahead and do this. Um, and you can kind of see how there's movement. And, and then, of course, if light happens, then that means ATP is made because that's what we have to do, right? So there's some light. Lightning happens. Okay, so um, furthering misconceptions about what ATP is. But anyway, uh, all right, so we're going to focus in on exactly how we had looked at this at the beginning of today. And let me go ahead and pause it right there. Okay, so... This is exactly what we looked at at the beginning of the day or the end of Wednesday. You're looking at essentially seven of the subunits of the F1 component, okay? The top one up here, this guy, those alpha and beta pairs are slightly different green colors. That would be in the O conformation. Down here, right here, these, are, these two alpha and beta pairs, you can see the ATP here, red rectangle, that's in the T conformation, 120 degree turn away from the O conformation in the clockwise direction. These guys here are in the L conformation, inorganic phosphate and then ADP, okay? This pink thing is, of course, the central stock that's being turned by the C ring, which is moving protons from P to inside, okay? So if we watch this, then we go, push play, okay, there you go. So what happened is that now, okay, let's push play, there you go. So it turned 120 degrees, this is now in the O conformation, and ATP left, okay? This is now in the T conformation, ready to have ATP depart, this is now in the L conformation, and this is gonna go around that way, and you can just watch this, let's just watch this one, it's in T, it'll go to O next. Okay, so it's in T, now it's in O, okay, now it turns again, this one goes from T to O, this one goes back to L, this one's in T. I mean, you can kind of watch, and, and ATP is just ejected as we move along, um, and, and the gamma shaft continues to rotate, okay? Now, you, you can't really see what's happening when that, when that gamma shaft rotates in this, but if we're, and I don't have a figure of this or anything like that, but if you can imagine ATP sitting in the, eight, uh, in the active site of the alpha and beta pair, um, and I put my two fists together or something like this, it, the ATP is kind of sitting like this, and what happens is that gamma shaft will get, hit the top of the, the alpha and beta pair and it goes out like this, okay? And it bends back and it, it kind of opens the can, if you will, and ATP just kind of diffuses out, okay? All right, so that's what's happening. I, I don't have time to go through that in, in all sorts of structural detail, but it's pretty, pretty awesome, okay? All right, questions on this? Yes, in the back. So, in this graph, I'm assuming, because you said that the, uh, that the gamma shaft goes straight through the uh, C ring, I guess you think, the center. And that route, they move together, correct? Yes, they do. It doesn't really go through the C ring, it just, it just sets up against it. Okay. Yeah, it doesn't go through it. It does, it, it sits, like, if the, I mean, if the, let's go back here. Okay, so, yeah, so, so the C ring's right here, and then this epsilon and this delta subunit make contact with that, and then they're in contact with this, the gamma shaft. And so the gamma shaft is right here, and so this thing starts to turn. Okay, of course I went in the counterclockwise direction. This thing turns, okay, and this turns, and then the stator actually holds the alpha and beta pairs stable, so they, they don't turn. You remove the stator and everything turns and, and nothing is made. Yeah. We'll, we'll talk about that too. Great question. You're just ahead of the game today. So the question is how does ATP get out of the mitochondria? That's a, an excellent question. We'll look at that too. Okay. I've got a whole slide on it. Okay. 
All right, now let's do this. Okay, let's go ahead and talk about um, about that C subunit and the number of subunits, our C ring and the number of subunits in it, and how that affects how much ATP is made. Okay, so let's let's start here. Okay, um, and we're looking here. Okay, this would be our, our gamma shaft. Okay, and we'll just put that little pink dot here. Um, each of these things, right, this would be the O conformation, that's an alpha and beta pair. We have this in the T conformation with ATP bound, and then we have this in the, uh, in the L conformation with ADP and organic phosphate bound. Okay, um, there's a certain number of protons that will have to go, so we'll call them N protons. Okay, and then we'll just put N number here. That will go from inside to P side. Now there'll be P side protons. That will go to cause a 120 degree change in the gamma shaft. Okay, and that will then eject ATP. That's going to have to happen again, right? We could draw this and say, okay, there's inside protons here. A certain number of them in the two ends, unfortunately. Okay, one of the ends represents the inside, the other end represents how many protons are there. Okay, these go to, the, again, the P side. Okay, there have to be a certain number of them. Okay, and if that happens, then this is going to, again, turn, and we're going to eject ATP again. Okay, and we could keep going in this, this direction. Okay, in, oops, inside protons, N of them, goes through to P side, in of those, okay? And again, that will turn and eject ATP. Okay. And it'll go in this 360 degree sphere. Okay, now, let's say this, okay? All right, if the C ring is nine subunits, which is the assumption that we made, it takes nine protons to make a 360 degree turn. Okay? All right. Because the C ring is going to pick up nine protons and it'll go all the way around 360 degrees and then eject its proton. Okay. All right. Now, the second thing, okay? A 360 degree turn And that's what I'm exhibiting here, 120 degrees, here, 120 degrees, here, 120 degrees. And a 360-degree turn will make three ATP, right? Because each 120-degree turn makes one ATP, here, here, and here, okay? Now, if that's the case, so we have a nine subunit C ring, nine protons are needed to make a 360 degree turn, that means that nine protons are needed to make three ATP, which means that, therefore, it takes right, three protons to make one ATP. Now, yes, I know. I have a feeling I know you're going to say. What are you going to say? Yeah. So what's, so what's the reason? So oh, no, maybe not. Is there like a thermodynamic minimum for how many of the subunits are required to make? Uh, like if you created a synthetic ATPase that had like eight or seven or whatever else. Yeah. I don't know if there is a thermodynamic minimum um, so for. for well, well it, it starts at 8 and goes to 15, right? So what, what would prevent it from being less than that? I don't know. Okay, what would prevent it being, from being more than that? I don't know. And I don't know if there is a thermodynamic minimum. Okay, but... Um, you, you could, in theory, increase efficiency, yes. It, there may be a structural limitation. You may not be able to form a C ring that will form 
um, an appropriate interaction with the AE subunit with any subunits less than eight. I, um, size, I would think, actually. I don't think steric hindrance, but more of the size of the ring, but I'm not sure. Because you have to think about distances that the C-ring uh, has to interact with each of the half channels. And if you, you take, if you take more and more of those C-rings away, that distance separating potentially the glutamate and the spartate residues gets larger, but I'm not sure. I mean, like I say, I don't know, that's just a guess. Yes? Exactly. Yep. So the question is, the, the amount of ATP made is variable depending on the amount of subunits and protons it takes to turn. Right now, if you look back in your notes, um, this number, it's, I says three protons to make one ATP. If you look back in your notes, I actually said four. Right? And we got our four. I said, well, if you have a C ring of nine subunits, Right, it'll mean an NADH PO ratio of two and a half ATP per um, NADH, right? And that would be 10 protons that are moved by NADH, four needed to make each ATP. But I'm saying three here, and the math works out. So where's that fourth proton? And this actually gets to this question I was asked earlier. I'll come back to that, okay? Well, this actually gets to this question I was asked earlier, how does ATP get out of the mitochondrial matrix? And a more important question for this is how does the inorganic phosphate get into the mitochondrial matrix? Okay, so to make ATP, so we're talking about here, we're saying there's n number of protons that have to go through the ATP synthase, okay, and that's dependent upon the C ring. We've said three for nine subunits, okay. ATP, once it's made, Okay, is going to leave the, the mitochondrial matrix okay, through this adenine nucleotide transocase. That's going to move ADP in. It's an antiporter. For every ATP that goes out, an ADP comes in. At the same time, you also need, this is inorganic phosphate, PI. Okay. You need an inorganic phosphate to come in so that you can make ATP. Right? That, if you'll notice here, has got a negative charge. It's going into a negatively charged environment that's electrochemically not favorable. So to move inorganic phosphate into the matrix of the mitochondria, you have to use energy and a proton moves into it. Okay. So every ATP that's made, you have to have X number of protons going through ATP synthase plus one. Okay, and that plus one is always to get the inorganic phosphate into the matrix of mitochondria. All right, so if we come back here, I said it's three plus one proton to move PI into the matrix. Okay, and that of course then equals the four protons, which means that it's going to be two and a half ATP per NADH. I've got a question. So given that, let's, let's just see if you can let's see how many of you followed what I was saying here. Okay, so let's do this. I'll give you two minutes to, to solve this problem with your neighbor. Okay, what would the PO, what would be the PO ratios for NADH and FADH2 if the C ring were made of 15 subunits? So not nine subunits, we're going to increase it by six subunits to 15 subunits. What would that PO ratio be? How would you figure that out? Report to me your answer in a number of ATP per NADH and FADH2, okay? Have fun. Okay, and your marks get set, go, two minutes. What do you think? What would it be?
Okay, about 20 seconds left. I only have 32 responses, so submit something. Just put two numbers down. <laughs> okay? You got 10 seconds left. Nine seconds left. This is our only question of the day. Four, three. Okay, let's check this out. See what people say here. Um, one and two thirds ATP, 10 and seven and a half, one and a half, five and three, 66% more. Well, be less actually. Um, Three and one, three and one, 1.65 and 0.99. It's pretty close. It's really close. All right, I'm going to highlight this one. This one's pretty close. It's not quite there, but it's really close. Okay, so 1.65 and 0.99. It's really 1.66 repeating in one. And you all say, ah, I see. How in the world did we get that? Look, I, I'm trying to find if there's anyone that put that. It looks like the numbers are all over the map. Wait. Oh, no, that's not it. Okay. All right, so I don't know, something high. Okay, then no, okay. So what happens is that it becomes the the it becomes actually less efficient. Okay, the more C subunits you have, it becomes less efficient. Now let's do this. Okay, let me come here and I'm gonna say this. If the C ring has fifteen subunits, all right, that means it takes 15 protons to make a 360 degree turn. Okay, this stays the same. A 360 degree turn always makes 3 ATP. Okay, so that means 15 divided by 3 means that there is 5 protons, therefore it takes 5 protons to make 1 ATP. Now, here's the next step, plus 1. Okay, so this is going to be a total of, okay, 6 protons per ATP, okay, from P to inside. Now here's the next step then, okay, NADH moves 10 protons. So 10 divided by 6, eh, okay, is equal to 1.67 ATP per NADH. And FADH2 moves six protons. I don't need to probably do the math. Six divided by six is one. Okay, so the PO ratios would go down to 1.67 and, and one. You can play around with these numbers. You can go anywhere from eight to 15, okay, and start to, to mess with this. But the more subunits, getting kind of to the interaction that we were having earlier, the more subunits you have, the less efficient your ATP synthesis. Okay. The less you have, the more efficient. Okay. Yes? Oh, yeah. The next question is what determines the number of subunits? I don't know. Okay. There, I, I can say this. There are, um, there are examples of an, the, um, of ATP synthases that have different numbers of C subunits in the same organism. Okay. I don't know if they are different in the same mitochondria, but I don't, I don't know if it's all that well regulated. I'm not, I'm not entirely sure. Yeah. Did you have a question? Um, so what happens if the number of C subunits doesn't evenly divide into three? Do you have to just go multiple cycles to get the same ratios? Yeah, okay, so what if it doesn't evenly divide into um, three? Uh, well, you still have, I mean, if it's, let's say, 11 subunits, right, you just replace 11, 11, and then still a 360 degree turn to make 3 ATP, okay? Um, and then you just take 11 divided by 3. And it would be a strange number. Your numbers start to get weird, okay? Um, but, and I, I, I mean, I, like the one that we have, 8, this structure was actually solved from what an ATP synthase that was expressed in bovine cattle. So, so anyway, I, I don't know if it's well regulated in terms of the numbers and how many and do you have 11, do you have eight? I mean, I know we have eight. Um, so, but I, I just don't know. I, that doesn't mean the field doesn't know. I just don't know. Yeah. Question. Where does the, the three NADH2, FADH2 numbers come from if the two and a half and one and a half are pretty high? Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah so. That's actually from direct experimentation before the discovery of these things. Okay, so the, the, the question, if you didn't hear him, was, well, where does three and two come from? Where do those PO ratios come from? If you look in like, uh, like intro biology text, well, you still use three and two. So, and that, honestly, that's not a bad number to use. So there have been people that have um, tried to, you know, determine the number of ATP that are being made based off of just direct observation and experiments. The problem with that is that you know, you're looking at what would be considered intact mitochondria. You isolate mitochondria from the rest of the cell. And then you make measurements of the amount of ATP that's made per oxygen that's being consumed. Those, that leads to, you know, statistical averages that end up being somewhere around three and two, okay? These are a lot more exacting because we can, you know, now that we know the structure of, if, of ATP synthase and the C-ring, we can pinpointed exactly. You can't honestly make two and a half ATP though, right? I mean, so that's an, even, even that's an average. Um, but, uh, but that's where that comes from, those, ex those types of experiments. They're fraught with error um, for a number of reasons. But. Other questions? Okay. I, I'm going to... I'm going to stop right there. We will cover this on Monday, the last slide, and we'll start fatty acids on Monday. Um, this is a really cool experiment that we have to talk about. So, okay? All right, so talk about that Monday, finish up then. But you could, th the quiz is fine. You're fine taking the quiz. Um, but we still have to finish this up. Okay, just a second. Let me...